All right, we got the meeting recorded. That's half the battle. All right, so I'm going to try and share my screen here with you. If I drop out, just bear with me, and I'll be right back. All right, can everybody see my think or swim? Should be looking at a chart of McDonald's right now. Okay, just want to make sure everybody can see it. All right, so as we talked about last time, uh, <clears throat> I want to go through the, the full application for IB uh, just because uh, there's some challenges to it, and uh, we'll see if we can get through it and, and help you guys out. Uh, I also had a question asked this week about uh, setting up uh, the Thinkorswim account and uh, kind of setting up uh, how to use it, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then if we still have time after that, we'll maybe talk about covered calls. And then uh, there's another webinar tomorrow night, same time. And we'll just continue on with whatever we got there. As always, if you guys have any questions at all, feel free to type them in. Um, and uh, I'll do my best to answer them for you. So, all right. All right. So, basically, I've already kind of put a, a little thing together to open uh, the IB account here. So, I'm going to kind of just continue that on. And uh, we'll uh, we'll see if we can get through it. Sometimes it asks for for some um, some information that I don't have readily readily available. So hopefully we won't run into that. But basically, I've already set this up. So if you'd already set up your username and password, that's what I've done here. So what we're going to do is we're going to finish an application here. Okay. So I believe I called this IB test six. Okay. Uh, IBTS three one six. All right, so when you guys are setting up an IB account, and again, it's it's entirely your choice if you want to or not. I just want to show you this, uh, show you this to you guys because um, I find that uh, you know, as I've said to you before, uh, the, it's a pretty great commission rate. It's not the best platform in the world, but it's not a bad platform. Uh, the reality is, is when you start trading more. I know when you're new, you won't trade much at all, but when you get uh, more active in your trading, uh, commissions do matter. Okay. So I'm just going to put in, you know, information, uh, you know, as you guys normally would. We'll get to the most important stuff shortly here. Uh, so we're looking at individual accounts here. Now, if you put individual account, you're going to you're going to run. It's going to default you to a margin account. OK, so I can't remember. I talked to you guys last time about margin, but margin is essentially where you put up some money and then your broker puts up some money. Uh, you know, allows you to borrow a little bit. Uh, it's usually two to one during the day. Uh, and uh, sorry, I apologize. It's sometimes four to one during the day and two to one overnight. Okay. And so you have to be careful when you start trading in a margin account. If you don't really, uh, you know, have a good grasp of what's going on with it, you're going to notice that you have a lot of buying power. And then at night, that buying power gets cut in half. So if you're carrying trades overnight, then you have to make sure that you're well within your bounds. Okay. Now, retirement accounts like uh, TSFAs, RSPs, uh, <clears throat> uh, Liras, locked in retirement accounts, anything like that, um, they're going to be what they call, <coughs> excuse me, cash accounts. Okay. And cash accounts, you get no margin in. Okay. Uh, we did talk about that last time. Uh, if you go to the retirement account here, uh, obviously you can see that there's a tax free savings account. Uh, there's a ret retirement account, which is the RSP, or it could be a spousal RSP. Okay, so you just basically have to choose this, you know, in whatever whatever one you're doing. Now, with the individual, with the uh, margin account, basically your trading is wide open there. Uh, you're going to find that when we and I talked about this last time as well. Um, when you start using tax-free savings account, which I know a few of you have. Um, you're going to be restricted to covered calls, uh, long calls, long puts, and then buying stock, essentially. Those are, those are about the only things you can do in there. Uh, when you start doing an individual account, a margin account, 
you can start doing spread trades you can do iron condors you can do you know all, all sorts of different strategies you can do straddle strangles a lot of stuff that you guys aren't quite ready for yet but the reality is there is something um, there is there is an advantage to having a margin account even if you're new and the reason being is your your return on investment your ROI and I'm not sure if you guys remember this from the class but your ROI when when you're only putting up a fraction of the money and the rest of the money is coming from your broker then all of a sudden your ROI jumps up in a big way okay so if you're doing you're doing a trade in a cash account let's say you're doing a uh, you know a covered call in a cash account you know you might be making two percent on that if you're doing it in a cash account well if you've got two to one margin all of a sudden now you're making a four percent ROI right because you're only putting up half and the brokers putting up half okay now with a margin account there is a very small and when I say very small it's it's really minute amount of interest that the, the broker will charge you uh, if you're using your margin uh, it's so little that it's almost negligible most people won't even recognize that it's on there but that's one of the ways brokers make money okay so just full full disclosure there all right so in this particular case we'll we'll go through this as if we were making an RSP account actually I know you guys got tax-free savings account so let's do that one so we'll go through this as if we're making a tax-free savings account you can denote, denote it to US dollars or Canadian dollars whichever you like now the thing about interactive brokers if you start with a base currency of Canadian dollars but you want to trade US stocks there's no problem with that they will automatically do the conversion for you uh, as you do your trading it will be seamless now the only thing is is they will charge you uh, uh, you know uh, uh, transaction fees uh, that kind of thing now it's much better to do a, a transaction inside your IB than it is to uh, because basically what they do is they lend you the money uh, you know they don't they don't necessarily convert your money you'll you'll see if you if you get into this um, if you're doing a, a, a US stock trade they won't convert your Canadian over you have to do that yourself if you want to they won't convert it over um, it'll sit there when you look at your account balance it'll say Canadian cash but what they'll do is they'll do the conversion and then charge you a little bit of interest on that as well so like I said just full disclosure here um, these are the kind of things that you'll want to know down the road okay so we'll just do a basic one here we'll say we're gonna do a Canadian dollar okay uh, how'd you hear about this you know what you can say seminar or whatever whatever you want there okay okay uh, just put in a bunch of stuff. I'll put in my stuff here. Just so we can get through this stuff. Date of birth. All right, so I keep going through this contact information. I'm not actually going to finish this, so it doesn't really matter. But uh, tax re residency, this is a big deal. Okay, so obviously not the Allen Islands, Canada, and then they're going to ask for your social insurance number, which I'm not going to bother putting in. They're going to ask you about your employment type, all that kind of stuff employer self-employed retired all that kind of stuff this is going to make a difference because um, it's, it's just like going for anything else uh, you know if you go for a mortgage and you're self-employed it's sometimes more difficult they won't um, they won't necessarily deny you especially if it's a cash account like we're doing here tax-free savings or an RSP none of that matters okay uh, you could be employed retired self-employed none of that none of that stuff matters okay um, and the reason being is if you're not using their margin then they won't let you trade any more than the cash you have in there so they they won't have any liability to it okay say employed and I won't go through all of this nature of the business you guys can do that that's pretty pretty standard stuff we'll see if it'll actually let me move forward through this security questions it probably won't let me move past this I might have to put in a bunch of stuff yeah that's what I thought so 
I'm going to make a bunch of stuff up here because, again, I'm not going to finish this. Security questions. This see, this is kind of getting crazy, but again, like I said, I won't be going through with this, so it's not a big deal. Um, we'll say ABBA just for for giggles here. Uh, maybe your first boss, Joe. My favorite teacher, also Joe. And continue. Invalid. Awesome. Okay. All right. So if you do an a tax free savings account or an RSP, you're going to want to add a, an, add a beneficiary to it. Okay. Um, you can add a successor, but you'll have to, you have to talk to your tax people about that. Um, adding a successor to a tax free savings account changes the nature of it. Um, so you'll have to consult your tax tax accountant about that. I can't give you advice on that. Um, I would recommend adding a beneficiary to a tax free savings account. Should anything happen, it will pass to your uh, to your heirs without getting taxed. Okay. So when you do this, you just add an individual, or you can add an entity if it's a corporation, whatever. Um, but just add it in there, and then you'll have to put in their information. I'm going to skip over that. Oh, of course, it won't let me. Right. So. This is kind of a pain sometimes, but let's just add one quick. I know this is a bit daunting for you guys, but uh, I think this is, uh, once we get to the next part, I think it'll be important for you. Invalid. Awesome. Uh, so a question coming in. Invalid. Awesome. All right. So John and Ashley, if you open an individual account, can you still use your TFSA, TFSA to trade from? Or do you need to open it? So that's the thing. You will need to open in uh, each account individually, but then what you can do is once you have the accounts open, you can link them so that you only have one 
um, login to go into. Okay, so then when you get into the actual platform, you'll see at the top it will say uh, TSFA or it will say, um, you know, margin account or it will say, you know, RSP, whatever it is. So you need to, if you're going to use these, um, I would, you know, you're going to need a margin account, you'll need an RSP account, and you'll probably need a TSFA. But like I said, once you get all three of those open, and you will have to go through this process for each one, uh, once you get those open, you can link them together. You go into your account management uh, uh, part of the website, and you can link accounts. And once you do that, then you can log in under one one login, and you'll have all your accounts active, and then you can trade from whichever one you decide to. Okay. All right. Now I got to figure out make up some some other numbers here. See if this worked. Didn't work. Awesome. Um, this might be a, a stumbling block. Yeah. Huh. I didn't figure this would trip me up, but uh, nope, not working. Okay, how can I do this? Okay, that one worked. Okay, so now we've got a beneficiary in there. Uh, you'll just have to do that same thing for your beneficiary. If you have two beneficiaries, obviously you can split it 50-50 instead of 100, whatever you choose to do. Okay, so they're going to ask you some questions here. Um, basically, they're going to ask you if you're a broker-dealer or part of the financial industry. Um, basically, most for most of you, I would guess that's no. Um, the reality is... is um, you know, are you an employee of a bank, hedge fund, exchange? Um, even if you're an employee of a bank or a commodities brokerage firm, they want to know about it. It doesn't mean that it's, they're not going to let you open an account, but they just want to know about it, okay? Um, so uh, next is uh, an account holder, director, 10% shareholder of any publicly traded company. I'm guessing that's not an issue for most of you as well. So here's where here's where things get interesting, okay? When you start being asked about your net worth here, um, you know, you know, obviously you want to be honest with it, but let me just tell you the ramifications. If you're under $100,000 of net worth, it's going to limit your trading, okay? Now, in the TSFA, it's not going to limit it too much uh, because the reality is, um, um, you, you know, you can only trade so many things there anyway. But when you start doing the uh, the actual um, margin trading again they have they have limits here of like I said I believe it's a hundred thousand that if you don't meet that threshold then they're gonna limit your trading they'll limit your margin they'll limit a lot of things okay and the reality is is later on if you want to get this changed let's say your circumstances change whatever uh, it can be a bit of a pain in the pain in the butt to get through this stuff. Net worth, obviously, does, you know, it is what it is. But uh, you're going to see that when we get to these investment experience, that things will be uh, a bit different. So um, again, just put in whatever your numbers are. It's it is what it is. Okay, and you'll net income whatever whatever it is. Okay. Now this is where it becomes interesting. So a lot of these things, if you go preservation for cap. Pres pres uh, sorry, preservation of capital and income. Uh, you know, if you just click those two, it only gives you certain things that you can do. Okay, so really, what you want to be able to do is you want to make sure that you're you're able to trade what you want to trade when you want to trade it. Okay, um, so the reality is, is, as you get further along, like you may be starting out uh, just to preserve the wealth you have, and you may just want to get a little income, but eventually. 
when you trade further, you're going to want to get growth. and You may want to do speculation. You may be going for trading profits, hedging, whatever the case may be. But just know that when you put these two in together, that uh, it's, it's going to limit uh, what you can trade. Okay. So uh, when I open these things up, obviously, you know, all of this stuff is important to me. But, you know, I, I speculate. I'm looking for growth. I do hedging and I'm doing trading profits. Okay. So just kind of a heads up there. Uh, it selects the investments you want to do, stocks. Now, here's where it becomes interesting. If you don't have at least two or three ex years of experience with stocks, um, in a cash account, it won't make too much of a difference usually, um, but in a margin account, it might. Okay. So, again, as I was saying to you guys in the last webinar, uh, the reality is, is you're going to get education that's going to put you ahead of the curve uh, for 90% of the people out there. And this, you got to remember that this application is made for everybody okay so at the end of the day the less experience you have the less they're gonna let you do and when you have to go back and you have to ask them uh, you know like let's say they only give you training uh, level authority one and you can only trade stocks and and uh, you know maybe maybe some long calls or something well the reality is is one of the best things that you're gonna learn is in, in my opinion is the covered call well, if you don't have enough experience, they, they probably won't let you sell a call. Okay, so you have to make sure that you get the right level. So I'm not telling you what to put in here. I'm just telling you kind of what goes on here. If you don't have, you know, two or three years experience in all of these things, then, then they're going to limit your, uh, your uh, trading. Okay, so I'm just to say I have at least three years experience, uh, you know, 25, over 25 trades uh, allows you to, to do certain things. And this is where, where it becomes interesting. If you put that you have limited knowledge in any of one of these things, they are definitely going to limit your trading. Now, right now, you might have limited knowledge, but I'd be willing to bet dollars to donuts uh, after you're done your master trader, which is uh, you know when you should actually start trading after that, um, then your, your knowledge will be at least good. And if you go further, you know, if you get a mentorship or you get, uh, you know, uh, options one or two, then all of a sudden I would I would say you know from from my experience that uh, you would be good to extensive okay but again if you put limited that's going to limit to what they'll give you okay that's just going to limit your um, uh, your trading ability okay so again I'm not telling you to be dishonest here I'm not telling you to do anything I'm just giving you the the straight goods of what what goes on here but the reality is is once you're done your courses. You know, if you take that master trader and you really understand it, I guarantee that if you went into a room of 100 people, uh, you would know probably more than 90 people, more than 90 uh, 90 percent of the people in that room. Okay, it's just uh, it's just the numbers that I've seen in my uh, in my experience. Okay, so in this case, I would go good. Uh, you know, you can put bonds uh, if even if you haven't traded bonds, but you may want to trade in the future. All of this stuff applies, okay? All of it's pretty much the same. Um, what they're trying to do here is they're trying to cover their own, uh, you know, their own backside, if they, if you will. They don't want somebody coming in here and starting to trade, you know, huge option contracts and blowing out their account and then turning around and suing interactive brokers. So they have to ask you these questions and you have to answer them, you know, to the best of your ability. And, uh, you know, you want to be, again, you want to be truthful. Well, even if you're not doing 26 to 50 trades a year, by the time you get through Master Trader, because you will be practicing these, you will have done this many trades, no question about it. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, options, again, you probably want to do this at some point. Again, you know, you have to, you have to kind of answer this on your own. I'm not giving anybody advice here. I'm just, like I said, telling you kind of what's happening, right? And, again, you know, I would say if you take these courses, uh, your knowledge level will definitely be good, if not better. Okay. Does everybody get that? I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on that. Okay. I'm not giving you advice on what to do, but what I'm telling you is I've already gone through this experience and I know that they have certain criteria that they have to meet. And I also know because I've already taken all the training that you guys are taking now and I know what it'll do for you. I know uh, the knowledge that you're going to gain from it is going to put you into a position that, that right now that you may not even, uh, you know, may not even uh, be able to comprehend. But 
believe you me, that, that stuff that you're learning right now, uh, I had a conversation with a banker uh, this past weekend, and uh, he couldn't even tell me what a put option was. And he works at a bank, right? And he actually works in an investment part of a bank. So, like I said, by the time you guys are done this, you know, you guys are definitely going to know what a put, put option is. You're definitely going to know what a call option is, right? You, you guys are going to know this stuff, and, and that's where it's going to put you uh, uh, well ahead of the curve, okay? Could you really review the investment objectives? Yep, yep, no problem, Jocelyn. So the investment objectives, okay. Um, preservation of capital, um, you know, basically preservation of capital might be uh, some fixed income stuff, right? You, you're, you're buying bonds because you just want to keep what you got. Um, speculation, obviously that's, that's uh, you know, you're looking at uh, long trades of, you know, you say, okay, uh, I'm looking at Apple and uh, I see that it's gone up for two years in a row and I fully expect that it's going to go up uh, to whatever price. That means you're speculating, okay? Now, we the way we speculate is a little bit different than that. Um, you know, obviously we do technical analysis and fundamental analysis and all those things, but that's basically what speculation is. Now, trading profits, trading profits, you know, that's going to fall under your, um, uh, you know, your spread trades, uh, those kind of things, um, you know, uh, uh, hard to say, straddle strangles, uh, uh, credit spreads, uh, debit spreads. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you guys are going to learn as you go along. Uh, that would fall under trading profits. If you're going to do this, you know, if you're going to be a swing trader or a day trader, which most of you will be either swing or position traders, unless you're actually day trading, um, then that's what you're going after is trading profits. OK, um, hedging is very simple. Uh, basically, when we're hedging something, this is when we might be using put options or we might be. Uh, um, yeah, basically put options would probably be or we might use futures contracts to hedge. So what that means is we're holding one position and we buy into an opposite position to protect that position from going down. Okay, so I'll give you an example. If I bought uh, 1,000 shares of Apple, and uh, I, I looked at the chart of Apple, and it was going up, and it, it got to a point of resistance, you know, a point where I thought it was really high, instead of selling my stock, what I could do is I could buy a put option, uh, you know, which gives me certain rights, which you guys will learn later. I won't go into it too much. But I could buy a put option, and then if that, if that stock fell, Instead of losing my gains, my put option would go up in value, and I'm basically hedging my position. Okay, so farmers do this a lot. Okay, uh, hedging actually started futures contracts started with the farmers. Um, you know, they they had uh, let's say they were putting their crops on, and the price of corn was whatever it is five dollars a bushel, right? Well, if they felt that their crops were maybe in a struggle that year, or you know what I mean, or maybe they're having a bumper crop. They might sell a little bit now and lock in a price, right? Hedge it, or they might, uh, you know, they might wait and, and sell it later. Uh, airlines do this a lot, okay? So airlines, when they buy fuel, okay, so um, you know they'll they'll have like a two or three year plan, right? So fuel might be a, a certain price now, and what they'll do is they'll buy contracts that allow them to buy fuel for say the next two three years at a set price. That means they're hedging their fuel costs, okay? So again, hedging is going to be an important part of your portfolio because after you learn the covered call, you're going to learn protective puts most likely if you're going into options, um, which I, I, I would definitely recommend. Um, you're going to learn put options, and that's what we use to hedge. Okay, and then growth is just like buying. You know, let's maybe say you're buying some blue chip stocks, and it's just going, you know, on and on. You're just you're just trying to create some some growth over time. Okay, so again, basically. If you choose, if you choose preservation of capital, it gets rid of speculation and trading profits. Okay. If you choose income, uh, you can still do growth and you can still do hedging, right? But the reality is, is it's this preservation of capital that that it, it doesn't allow you to do certain things, right? So I think we can do all of these. No. So as soon as you go for income or preservation of capital, it won't let you speculate or have trade trading profits. Okay. Um, so again. The reality is preservation of capital is, again, you, you'd probably be looking at fixed income, things like that. Income, uh, again, typically that's bonds, that kind of thing. But I, my, my expectation when I started, 
uh, was that I was going to be speculating. I wanted trading profits. That's what we are. We're going to be traders. I wanted growth. I wanted my portfolio to grow. And I also wanted some income, which is going to come anyway, right? Um, you know, but again, it took this away. So I just kind of had to, to pick these two. Um, and hedging and growth. Because you're going to get the income from the, the options anyway. Uh, so again, that's kind of these two affect all the rest of this. That's what I'm saying really. Does that help, Jocelyn? Got it. Awesome. Okay. So again, like I said, it doesn't really matter that much which ones you, you pick, uh, except for, like I said, if you end up picking preservation of capital and income, then they may not let you do all the trades you want to do. Okay. Um, so trading company uh, countries, uh, definitely, I just click all. Right, because I want to trade in Canada and the U.S. Okay, now when you do this for a margin and you click all, uh, it's going to give you a lot more countries. But the reality is, is I don't ever want to be uh, hamstrung. Okay, uh, there's some great, um, uh, great companies out of Europe uh, that uh, that I like to to look at. Um, there's some out of, uh, you know, there's there's Asian companies. There's all sorts of different things. So you know, this this one when you look at trading companies, you just don't want to um, you just don't want to limit yourself, okay? So you can just put, you can click all, and, and then you're covered, okay? Like I said, this happens to be a tax-free savings account, so it's only going to give us Canada and the U.S., all right? Okay, so this is going to ask you about uh, uh, tax residence questions. Um, basically, it's going to ask you if you have, you know, a uh, certain status in the U.S., okay? Um, basically, do you have a taxpayer identification number? Some of you may. I don't. Um, do I qualify for the tax treaties? Yes, I do. Uh, if you're Canadian, basically the income tax treaty for RSPs and TSFAs um, basically says uh, we we don't have to pay the tax uh, on. I can't remember. It's they'll, they'll withhold 15% of any dividends, and then the RSPs and the um, uh, the TSFAs, I believe that it's taxed in your home country. Okay, so uh, it does it say do you qualify? You absolutely do. It says you have not selected a, a treaty country, uh, so I got to go back up. Uh, you have not selected a treaty country, even though you may have connections to the country that executes a failure to select a treaty country. So basically, just basically saying, okay, I'm a beneficial owner or a resident of Canada, and that means I'm good with the income tax treaty, okay? And declaration just tells me, gives me a, it makes up a number for you. This will, this will be, that'll be the uh, social insurance number, okay? Then there's going to be a whole bunch of uh, um, legalese, if you will, all this stuff here. Um, you guys can read read all of this. Basically, it's what you're signing. I won't go through that because we'd be here for a month reading all of that. Um, again, so when we sign this up, when you print your name, uh, basically you're, you're signing your name. Okay, it's all done kind of electronically here. Uh, so by checking this box, you can send to collection or tax in electronic form. And pay. Uh, that's up to you whether you want to do it uh, manually or um, electronically. Um, pretty much everything is going electronically nowadays. but. All right, so all these agreements, again, feel free to read all through these. Some of them, you know, disc risk disclosure for Forex trading. All of this stuff is stuff you want to know. Um, again, it's a lot of reading. Uh, the reality is it's we got to sign them. Um, it's, again, this is kind of uh, cover their, their backside for IB. You know, they'll, they'll have one in here about uh, order routing, right? So they'll do, they have a mandate where they, they route your orders in the best way they can. But again, they can't be held liable if, if your fills aren't great, uh, things like that, okay? So you have to basically agree to all of those. And again, there's lots more, lots more legalese here that you guys can read through. All right, so now this is asking me, we're getting ready to fund it here. So I won't be doing any funding. I actually won't be going any further than this. But if you do a cash transfer, 
Obviously, it's going to ask you what currency it's in, and that means you're going to put money into it. You can do this through bill payment. You can do it through wire. You can do it through, um, I'm not sure the other ones. Basically, those are, those are about the main two. Now, what you can do is you can do what's called a position transfer, okay? So if you already have a brokerage somewhere else, Okay, let's say you've got it I trade or whatever, and you do what's called a full ATON, A T O N. Basically, what will happen with that is it will transfer all assets over, including cash and positions. Okay, so if you're already using another broker, but then you want to use uh, IB as your exclusive broker, sorry about that. Um, wow, these things just keep popping up. Um, so if you want to use them as your broker, you can say, uh, you know, you want to move it through whatever. You just choose whatever your broker is. Down to iTrade here, Scotia, Scotia iTrade, right? Click that, and then they'll ask you for your account number. And what will happen is they'll move those assets for, for you. Um, you're basically going to sign at the bottom saying, take this take this from this other institution you're gonna to have to put a, a an account number in here which I don't have uh, I won't be actually able to do this part for you guys but just know that you have you have two ways of doing this you can do a position transfer or you can do a cash transfer if you do a position transfer it takes any stocks options anything you may have it sends it all over for you and they basically take care of it it takes takes a few weeks to get it moved um, sometimes it could take four weeks, five weeks, sometimes it's quicker, sometimes it's two weeks, it depends, okay? Now it's probably, now this is kind of where I have to end this uh, because I can't really go much further than this without putting in an account number that I don't have and of course this would this would actually set in motion something that, that I don't want to, to happen. So um, basically at this point you get to funding and then uh, section five is uh, they're going to ask you for documents, okay? They're going to ask you for a bank statement when you sign up for this. It has to have your name on it. They have to prove who you are. So if you have a bank statement, you can just basically uh, download it or upload it to them, uh, or you can send it in by snail mail, whatever whatever you want. You can actually even fax it in as well. And, um, you know, basically that's how you fill out this form, okay? This is the, it's, it's not really that hard. What it comes down to, the main important things are, you know your your investment objectives, your experience, those kind of things are are going to uh, decide what you can trade and, and what you can't trade. Okay, um, if you tell them that you have no experience at all, they're going to leave you at a level one trading, and you will not be able to trade covered calls, um, which is basically in a TSFA and an RSP and a lira. That's probably the best move you have. Uh, you can do long calls and long puts, but uh, um, personally, I think selling calls is, is a little better than, than buying calls myself, and I think you guys may find that as you go along. Okay. All right. Any any questions here about this? Was this valuable to you guys? Is, you know, did you get anything out of this? I know it can be daunting. I've I've had students that I've I've gotten calls from. Um, you know, when they're trying to fill out their forms, they don't they don't get this kind of uh, you know bird's eye view, if you will. So um, anyway, I just wanted to show you guys that, and and like I said, if you have any questions, if you're if you happen to be filling out this, or you have any questions, uh, you can. I'm gonna put my email address up uh, again at the end of tonight, and uh, you can always send me questions. I'll be more than more than happy to answer them. So, so Jocelyn says in the tax section, I should enter my U.S. Social Insurance number. Yeah, so that's gonna be a little different for you, Jocelyn, because you're you're dual citizen. Um, but yeah, just just if you have it asks you basically if you have uh, you know a, a U.S. social insurance number, then yeah, you you definitely want to put it in there. So, okay, so Celia asks if I don't have a TSA TFSA, do I need to open one? Well, Cecilia, that's 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 up to you. Um, but let me let me tell you a little bit about TF, TFSAs. Um, they're probably the only good thing that the government's done for us in, in probably the 46 years I've been alive, to be honest with you. Um, with the, with the tax-free savings account, uh, we, we can trade in it, which is, which is amazing. And you never pay any tax on that. And, and there's no, there's a limit as to what you can put into it, but there's no limit as of yet anyway there's no limit on to on to uh, on uh, to what you can make out of it so 
Uh, it's one of the only ways, and I only know of a couple, even as a financial advisor, there's only a couple of ways uh, to get, get tax-free retirement income. And, and that's, that's through a TSFA and uh, another thing through uh, life insurance. But um, my, I can't give you recommendations. I would just say that looking into the TSFA, uh, it's, it's probably a good idea for most people. Um, again, you know, why pay tax if you don't have to? I guess that, that's, that's kind of where I'm going with that. If you don't have to pay tax, uh, why, why, uh, why pay it? You know what I mean? We, we pay enough tax as is. Um, you know, we're our, our highest tax bracket right now, I think, is up around 53%. So, um, you know, my, my, my question to you would be why pay uh, tax if you don't have to? Okay, because you can make, you can, uh, you can create the same kind of income in a TFSA as you can create in an RSP or a margin account, right? When you learn to do covered calls, you can do that in there in a TFSA, and then all the income you make off of that, uh, you can take it out. And there are rules to taking it out. You'll have to Google that. Um, you know, it's actually not rules to taking it out, but it's actually rules to putting it back in. So, um, like I said, I would recommend that you, you Google tax free savings account. If you have questions, specific questions about it, uh, feel free to email me. Um, but I would definitely, I would definitely say it's it's one of the best things that's happened to us in a very long time. Okay, so I'll let you, uh, I'll let you decide if it's right for you or not. But um, you know, if you've got it, if you've got a, an investment account open right now, uh, right now, if you've never put into a TSFA, I think you can put in up to fifty one thousand um, dollars. I think that's the number we're at now. Um, you know, so if you put $51,000 into that account and you started earning some income off of it, all of that income you earn off of it is tax free and, and that's hard to beat. So, all right. See a few other folks type in here. Um, so John says, can you open an account with a thousand dollars? Um, so what they say, um, John is, um, they say you need a minimum of 5,000 or 10,000. I can't remember what it is for interactive brokers here, but what you can do is you can call them up and you can say, uh, you know, I'd like to open a, an account right now with a thousand dollars. I plan on putting more in later kind of thing, but I'd like to get started now so that I can paper trade and do whatever you can talk to them. Um, I've, I've talked to a few people and essentially, you know, they've opened it with less than 5,000 and they're usually pretty good. They don't want to turn you away, but they may have some rules. Um, what I would suggest is if you're going to open it with a thousand, I think you can do that. Actually, I think you could start with a thousand. Um, I've never heard, let's put it this way. I've never heard of anybody getting turned down for a thousand. Now, the only issue with a thousand is there's, the, you know, only so much you can do with it, but that's fine. Um, the good news is once you open one, you also get a paper trading account with uh, free with, with IB, which is good as well. Um, again, if you're opening it with a small amount and they give you any hassle, um, just give them a call and say, look, I, you know, I'm opening it with this. I know your limits are this. I plan on adding more to it later, whatever, you know what I mean? Okay. Hopefully that answers your question, but yeah, I, I believe, I believe you can open it with a thousand, I believe, but don't quote me on that again. They may, they may call you and ask you, you know, are you going to put more in? Well, of course, at some point you would always put it in, right? So, but yeah, I, I believe you can open with a thousand. They do have minimums on there, but again, you know, I, I've never heard of a business like this ever turning down money. Okay. Now they may, they may limit what you can trade with a thousand, right? They're, they're definitely not going to let you trade. Uh, yeah, they're definitely not going to trade, let you trade futures with a thousand dollars or they, they may even limit your options, but, uh, they, they, I, again, I, I've never heard of them turning anybody down. Okay. So Johnny and Nancy asked, uh, should Nancy and I create separate IB accounts or use one? We both want to max our T TFSAs. Yeah. So, uh, the reality is with a TSFA, um, I would suggest because you both have one, um, that you do it individually. Um, I've never opened a joint TSFA account. I, I, I don't even know if you can, but I would definitely recommend that you open your own just because you both get to put, uh, like I said, I think it's 51,000 in there, uh, each person. So, um, that would be my recommendation to you is to, uh, is to both open an account. Okay. 
All right. Uh, any last questions, and then we'll kind of move on. I'm going to go to Think or Swim, and then tomorrow night we'll we'll talk about we'll we'll start talking about covered calls because I know uh, uh, everybody wants to go into that, but I, I want to answer uh, uh, some things about uh, Think or Swim tonight because I've had some questions about it. So if there's no more questions, I'll get right into Think or Swim here. Okay. If you have questions, just type them in, and I'll answer them as they come. Okay. So. The question I was asked is about how, how we set up our Thinkorswim, okay? So you guys can see my Thinkorswim right now. Um, this is not how it looks when you first start, okay? Um, there's a couple of things that, that uh, you know, obviously you'll see this screen come up. Uh, you'll have simulated trading if you have your paper account open. There's a couple of things that can help us uh, set this up uh, better than, than just the base, okay? So if we go to this little cog wheel here and we click on that, you're going to see all these things come up, all these chart settings, okay? So, you know, you can read through all these. I won't go through each of these, but uh, the reality is, is every one of these things in here will affect your charts, okay? Some of them don't mean anything. Some of them mean something. So, you know, if it says uh, show symbol logo here, uh, do you guys see this little McDonald's here? Can you guys see where I'm pointing right now? Let me pull up your little thing here. So, Does everybody see where I'm pointing to here? Yeah, so you can see that it has a logo there. If you don't want the logo there, you just unclick this, click apply, and the logo goes away. You can see it's gone, right? Not a big deal, right? That's It is what it is, but there's lots of little things like that. Um, you know, if you want it, great. If you don't, that's fine. Um, so going back to this cogwheel, there are some important things here. Uh, you can overlap volume, which you'll see it on your chart here. If I click apply. Now it shows now it shows my volume. It shows it in the actual body of the chart. Okay, so for some people that's good um, because then it doesn't mess with their indicators down here. Okay, but if you don't like that, just click it and take it off and hit apply and Bob's your uncle. Okay. Now one of the coolest things here is you'll notice that uh, there's a fair bit of space between the last candle and the edge of the page. Excuse me. With that, um, the reality is, is when you start this, when it's it's in default, you're going to see that this candle is going to be right over here to the right edge. Okay. So what you do to move that is, you go into time axis here, and see this area that says expansion area here. You can click that, and you can put zero, and I'll show you what this is. So this is what the default chart looks like. Okay. So it pushes everything over to the right. I personally don't like that. I kind of like to have a little bit of space here so that I can kind of visualize, uh, you know, what I think is going to happen with the chart. And so it's as easy as clicking that, going to time axis, and clicking. You can do 10 bars, and it'll move it over 10 bars, right? Just give you a little bit of space, or you can do a lot of space, whatever you choose to do there. Um, that's probably one of the things that, that most people like to do is they want to see, um, you know, they want to see a fair bit of, uh, you know, room to the right. Okay. So um, show expiration Friday here. So when you start trading options, okay, so this will be, I believe these are the expiration Fridays here. So what's that? So, uh, 216. So these are the expiration Fridays, I believe. Now that can't be right. Let me think about this for a second. No, sorry, these must be the rollover lines. Uh, where's my expiration Fridays? 19, 16. Yeah, I'm not seeing it here. Um, anyway, uh, it's weird on this one. On, on my chart, I have it better set up. Um, let's get back to time axis here. So the rollover lines, uh, basically, it marks the rollovers. Now, when I say when they say rollovers, I'm actually not even sure what they're talking about there. But expiration Friday is shown with vertical lines, so this must be an expiration Friday for McDonald's. Let me see if that's that's correct. So uh, 61518. So if we go to the trade tab here. 615. Yep. So June 15th, 18 is an expiration Friday. So basically these red lines that we're looking at, uh, so 518 is the monthly, right? So these are showing you the monthly, uh, where we go, May 18th, right? 
and you'll see on this chart here it says May 18th, 18. So these are your monthly option expirations. They don't show your weekly, but they show your monthly. Okay, some people like that on their charts, some people don't. Okay, so it's entirely up to you. Um, you can take that off just by unclicking that. You can show the year marking lines uh, right here. You see 2017, right? Instead of having to look down here, uh, you can show 2017. Obviously, this is 2018. If we do a longer chart here, if we go to the three year weekly chart. Right, you can see 2015, 2016, 2017, and then when you're doing your back testing, you can see all sorts of data. Okay, but again, these are all going to be personal preference to you. Okay, um, you know uh, what else is here for the time axis? Um, yeah, that's pretty much it here. Um, one, let's see, go back to general here, sub price graph. So that we don't want, we want that on there. There's a way to get rid of these uh, silver lap volume again. Um, there's a way to get rid of these these lines here. Um, it's been a while since I did that. So um, some people like to have a clear black background. Uh, let me see. I'll let you guys kind of play with this a little bit, but uh, there's a way here. Time access. Time frames, appearance. Grid. Okay, so if we get rid of the grid here and click apply, the grid goes away. Okay, you see that? So now we've got a clear black background. All right, so basically with this stuff, it's just kind of personalized. Right, favorite time frames. Uh, you know, I use six month chart a lot. I use the one year. Uh, when I'm day trading, I use the five minute and the one minute charts. You know, so you can just add whatever you like. If you like, you know, if you're doing you know quicker trades, you might use the three month chart whenever you want. Appearance wise, so uh, you can have the uh, the the um, candles fill or not fill. Whatever you whatever you feel like. Uh, you can have the Doji in white. That tells you that a doji candle has come in. Uh, it gives you an easy way to look at things, right? You can see, oh, doji candle here. The doji, if you guys are not sure how far along everybody is yet, but a doji candle basically signals indecision, right? So it means the buyers and the sellers had a big battle, and really nobody won the day that day. And so it can, it doesn't always mean that that a, a reversal is is imminent, but sometimes it does. So it's something that we pay attention to. And you can see that they put it in white. Uh, again, you can change that if you want to change that. That's fine. Um, you can put in uh, volume. Uh, like I said, show volume subgraph. Um, you can show extended hours trading sessions. That's all. Where's the ATR? Yeah, I'll show you that in a minute. Yeah, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, you can show the last price. You can show the mark price. You can show pretty much everything there. Um, options again you can show the open interest you can show the theoretical price so all of this stuff you can change on the fly uh, you just kind of got to find what you what you like uh, personally I leave the uh, I leave the colors alone because that's kind of what I've, I've you know I've been using for 10 years now um, favorite time frames is pretty self-explanatory and the only one that's that's really I find is good is this expansion area the 50 bars to the right or the 10 bars to the right. I find that's uh, that's good for trading, but again, it's up to you guys, okay? And then just general settings, all right? So that's kind of that's kind of that part of it. Um, now, uh, John and Ashley asked where the ATR is. So this is where this little beaker. You guys remember science class? Kind of looks like a little beaker there. You know, one of those. You know, I don't even know what beaker is what they call them. I guess. Um, if you click on the beaker, this is how you get to change things on the charts, okay? So you can see right now that I have three moving averages. So let's look at that. So, so you can see that I've got a, a green line, a yellow line, and a blue line, okay? So you can see up here, the blue line is the 10-day moving average. That's why it's got a 10 there. Uh, the green is a 20-day 20, 20 moving average, and the yellow is a 50-day moving average, okay? And you guys will learn, as you go through Master Trade, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, learn what the moving averages are all about. And if you guys are in my labs, 
or on tackle training. Um, you guys will learn uh, learn about those as well. Okay, they're 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 quite useful. Okay, uh, something I would recommend that you you, you take some time to study. Um, but again, I keep those on my charts all the time. Um, I have what's called historical and implied volatility. Um, again, this is a measure. Uh, the reason I use volatility is I want to know if option pricing is normal or abnormal. And again, you guys will learn that as you go along. Uh, probably more in, in options one than master trader, but you will be introduced to volatility, okay? But basically, if you want to add anything onto your chart, so the one that John and Ashley asked is where the ATR is. So if you look to the left here, you'll see ATR right there. If you highlight that and click add selected and then click apply, it will come down on your chart, okay? So you guys, uh, if you hopefully you can see this here. Um, if I put my cursor on a candle here, uh, if you look down in the left-hand corner here, right down here, see where it says A14 Wilders, okay? Whatever candle you put on it is what it will tell you your ATR is for that day, okay? So if you're starting to get into trades, if you're doing, you know, if you're entering a trade and it's 10% of an ATR above uh, the high price of the day, that's where you're going to get your information, okay? So with this beaker, you can add and subtract pretty much anything, okay? Um, you could put this in with the volume. You can just hold your cursor and move it up. You know, you can move it back down. Uh, we could add uh, Bollinger Bands, right? If you just start typing it in, you can add Bollinger Bands. Um, you know, got two of them there. Click Apply, and then you're going to see a bunch more lines on my chart, okay? So Bollinger Bands, you guys will learn what that is as well. If you go to Tackle Trading and you read my Rookie Corner blog, you can hear all about Bollinger Bands. But um, basically, these are called studies. And whatever studies, whatever indicators you, you become comfortable with, that's where you'll add them is in here, okay? So there's moving averages. There's um, the MACD. There's uh, the RSI. There's just, there's just, well, literally, you can see the list of them here. There's a bazillion indicators, stochastics. Um, you know, just it's just basically unlimited. Okay. Um, again, I would recommend that you learn you learn about a few of them, and then find which ones you like and stick with those. Okay. Um, because you know you can you you guys can see right now on my chart uh, when I had that Bollinger Bands on here plus the moving averages plus the volume, this got pretty pretty jammed up, right? Like pretty hard to read, especially for someone who hasn't been doing this for, for a while, right? So you want to kind of keep things simple. Uh, that would be my best advice to you. Just find a couple of indicators that you like and then just kind of use them, you know, and get and get really familiar with them because the reality is is what we're teaching you in Master Trader um, and, excuse me, from Tackle Trading as well, is we're trying to, we're trying to get you to understand that the trading when it's simple is is more effective. You don't need a whole bunch of, you know, you don't need a whole bunch of indicators. Basically, if you can learn technical analysis, which is what you learn in Master Trader, and you can learn how to read price charts through candles, uh, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna be well on your way to to being successful. Um, you know, the reality is is when I mentor someone, when I teach someone, um, the first thing I do is I take all the indicators off. And then I teach them how to read the candles and read them very effectively. Once you can start doing that, then we'll add in some volume because it's important as well. But if you have price and volume uh, and you can read those effectively, um, just with those two things alone, you can trade well, uh, you know, if you're willing to learn it. So um, anyway, that's that's kind of where that goes. Basically, the only other setup that we do here for Thinkorswim is when you go into the monitor tab here, Okay, you'll see that I have, I'm going to minimize this, you'll see that I have some positions on here, okay, and there's there's more to think or swim, and we'll maybe do a little bit more of this tomorrow or something, but you can see that I have a bunch of positions on here, right, okay, if I click this little cog wheel here, see how I've got all these, uh, so I've got uh, a quantity, I've got days, I've got the mark, which is the middle price, uh, it's how much the, the price has changed, percentage, profit, loss, open. Some of these I don't really care about, like percentage change, mark change. These are all defaults. But if I want to change some of these, I just click this little cog wheel, and it gives me a whole brand new setup here. Okay. So if I don't like this thing, I can get rid of it. I don't like the mark change. I don't like the percent change. 
but what I look for is I want to know my delta number and I want to know uh, I will bring the mark back I want to know my net liquidation is one that I use um, the one that uh, I think is most valuable is the trade price okay so when I'm looking at this I want to know what I paid for something so if I click OK now you can see that these columns up here have changed so this is number of days so if we have an option I don't have an option there have one there don't have one there don't have one there okay awesome so let's go to uh, tackle 25 all right so I have an option here no I don't I know I have an option somewhere here we go so I have an option here okay and it says days that's days to expiration for the option okay all right but the the main important thing is here and of course it only did that for the ones I wanted it to. So my delta number, I always want to know what my delta number is. That's very important, and you guys will learn that as you, as you go through your training. Uh, the mark price or market price, that's the, that's the price basically right now. You can use last price as well. Net liquidation is what it's worth, right? If you have 1,000 shares at 61.31, it's worth $61,310. Pretty simple, right? But more importantly is the trade price. Do you guys see the trade price? 61.25. Well, then I know if it's 61.31, I've made six cents a share on this particular stock. Does everybody understand that? That's why I think trade price is one of the more important ones. And you can do profit open loss. You can do profit day. You can do profit year to date. You can do all sorts of things. Okay. All right. So it's 8.02. Uh, any questions? We'll, uh, we'll continue this on. We'll do another webinar tomorrow night. Um, you know, uh, I want to catch up from last week. I apologize for the uh, inconvenience of last week. Uh, I could not get into the room. I, I actually got into it, but I could not get in as a host. It was a problem that I was unable to fix. So uh, we got her all straightened out now. So we're going to do another one tomorrow night. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about... Um, Okay, uh, Jocelyn wants to talk about creating a watch list. Absolutely, we can do it. We can do a watch. So tomorrow night we're going to talk about doing a watch list, do a little bit more on Thinkorswim, and then we're going to talk about the covered call as well. So hopefully you all can come back and uh, we'll get into that. Um, I'm going to put my email address back up here. Discussion notes. There it is. I'm going to make it bigger. get bigger still all right so that's my email address there in the discussion notes um, give me just, if you have questions please just send them along to me uh, I want to make these uh, these uh, webinars as valuable as possible for you guys I want you guys to hit the ground running and uh, th I think this is the best way to do it so all right folks uh, thanks so much for coming out and we will talk to you tomorrow night at seven o'clock have a great day